I got interested in the use of, of software for collaboration about 17 years ago, so it was 1994. I was doing my uh, PhD at uh, Cass Business School in London, and I was using server log data to see how people actually use software. So that pretty much was the, the foundations of, of this business. And then as we began to look at how people then used the software and what they were doing it for, what came out as people were doing it for innovation, um, and that was pretty much the, the starter for, uh, for Imaginatic. So Imaginatic is focused on tapping into the brain power of hundreds and thousands of people to solve problems. Um, we're a software company, so we do this through software and through business process. Um, and we do this for some of the very best companies in the world, the Pfizer's, Hewlett Packard's, IBM's, uh, Nokia's. And we do this by really um, understanding that there is a genius that exists, um, particularly when you have this sort of collective intelligence. And if you just focus and concentrate that brain power with a sort of human laser beam effect, you can solve problems faster um, and cheaper um, and at a scale that has been unimaginable with any other technique. Because a typical entrepreneur typically has no money, bags of debt, unbelievable amounts of risk, and by and large, if they're lucky, they'll make slightly more money than they would do working at McDonald's. That's a typical entrepreneur. You might have your freedom, and you might be doing something that's fantastic and passionate, working with great people, but quite often for a typical entrepreneur, there's no money in it. Um, being a successful entrepreneur um, is materially different. I mean, it's just hugely different if you actually do something that is absolutely successful and it makes the financial returns that make all of the risks worthwhile. Um, in fact, one of the pieces of advice that I give entrepreneurs um, starting out today is that you need to make sure that if you are going to go down the route of being an entrepreneur, you need to make sure that what you do can be big enough if it works out to basically pay for all of the mistakes and all the risks you'll have to take. A lot of people go through massive amount of risks, and in the best case scenario, they make $60,000 a year out of it. The more people that you tell about what it is that you're doing, all of a sudden people pop up to help. And you have no idea who you should be speaking to. The thing though is you almost need to speak to a volume of people to share your ideas with. And to do that, ideally they've sort of somewhat to some extent like-minded, to some extent maybe in the same industry. So therefore going to networking events in your industry, outside of your industry, uh, local networking events, allows you to pretty much go to people that are potentially like-minded to say, hi, I'm setting up a yoga salon in San Diego and I want to do this and this and this. And you might find out that the person you're speaking to has just arranged a set of skincare products and is looking for a venue and all of a sudden you have a relationship with. Unless you go out there, um, you will not know that those connections can happen. So really you need to go for a volume of networking events, be open on what it is that you, you're after. Don't be pushy by saying, can you help, can you help, can you help? I mean, you can do, but that tends not to work so well. And goodness will come to you. To encourage employees to innovate, um, you need to do a few things. Um, one of the things is that as leaders of an organization, you have to tell your employees what your vision, your objectives are in your company. Innovation is about doing stuff that delivers value. And if your employees start, um, let's say, we have a software company. Uh, we do collaborative software for innovation. If we have employees that say that, well, maybe we could build um, some software to process credit card transactions. Well, yes, we could build it, but that's not the goal of the company. We're focused in this area. So this means that leaders really need to lead, and leaders need to give um, that vision and that sort of uh, mandate for innovation to their organization so that employees at least know what they can do. The next thing is to have that sense of freedom, to actually give people an opportunity to think, um, to be willing to listen. So there's a degree of openness that needs to exist within an organization to have ideas come through, to be listened to. And then I think the third thing is that you need to act. Because right now anybody can say that innovation is important, but unless you actually take action within an organization, unless you actually execute on those ideas, you lose a lot of credibility, you lose trust. Um, and also, innovation is about delivering value, and if you don't deliver the value, you weren't innovating, you were creating. So what you then need to do is you need to make sure that you actually execute on those ideas that actually start bubbling up. So those would be the three things.
right now, um, I mean, the, the notion that what we're doing is sort of in some way dysfunctional happens because there are older generations that look at it to say, well, in my day and age, you only had three TV channels. Why on earth would you? What's quite interesting is that if one looks through history, um, those people that said, oh, this new trend is wrong have almost always been proven wrong themselves. What you're finding is that there is this sort of um, new generation that picks up stuff that's new, but in that same way, this generation now that's picking up the Facebooks, the MySpace, the iPhone, in 15 years' time, there will be new stuff that comes out. Really new, I, mean, I have no idea what it is. If I did, I'd be probably trying to do it and make some money for shareholders out of it. But there will be something new that comes out, which means then that's, that's sort of the current generation of whatever hitting 25. When they hit 35, 38, they'll be saying, I don't think this stuff makes sense. Kids these days, they have no clue. Now, when I was a kid, I was just using Facebook, Twitter, and iPhones. I mean, these people these days, they're mad. They're crazy people. They'll still be right. Being a public company meant that it improved our visibility with our customer base. It improved our credibility. So the companies like your CSEs and the Pfizer's can say, this is a good company, it's different from the others, they're financially stable, they're transparent, that first and foremost. Next thing then is that for employees, it gives them a real serious sense of ownership. Um, a lot of people in companies give stock options to their staff as private companies, but for those people that live through .com and those people that have worked for private companies with stock options, stock options are worth nothing. It's a Word document that does a printout. Unless the company is sold under certain circumstances, you're going to get nothing out of it. Being public, you can look onto the, onto whatever, the Yahoo Finance website, whichever one you want to use, and see what the price of your shares are. And it has, can, and potentially have a lot of real tangible value. So it can be, <coughs> particularly if the share price goes up, a very motivating influence for your customer, for your employees. Um, and then finally, it does give you a platform to raise more money with um, relatively few conditions. Your company has to be IPO worthy, which means that it has to be big enough, have an opportunity of making money for investors and everything else. And then you need to have the base structures and processes and people in place to actually be worthy of being a public company. That could be something as basic as, do you have the tools and techniques required to do quarterly or half yearly reporting? But what's actually quite interesting, when you go down through the process and you get lawyers and everybody else, everybody uh, and like your advisory team is concerned about reputation. And what actually happens is that you can actually go quite a long way down the process of doing an IPO, um, in retrospect, not getting very far. Because it's almost as though I will, um, we did pre-marketing with an investment bank, which meant that we went with this investment bank to visit six institutional investors, so uh, pension funds. And the key there was that if the pension fund said, yes, this was interesting, the investment bank would be interested. But those advisors would rather, they invested a little bit of time and effort to take us out to those funds, by the way, four of them out of six said yes, um, to get that validation before they might move to the next step. So it's actually quite interesting as an entrepreneur going down this process, it looks as though you're getting really, really far down the process, but in fact, you go through one hurdle to get through to another hurdle. The economic crisis, recession, and I actually personally believe that it's sort of depression is not an unrealistic probability. Um, it does create challenges in that um, if you have lots and lots of cash and lots of customers coming in, um, you can take risks on cash, you can grow your business. But um, I think one of the, the key things right now, for example, as a business is uncertainty. Nobody knows what's going to happen in four weeks' time, let alone four months or four years. So it makes it quite difficult from a planning perspective to plan for business. Um, now, however, I um, graduated university in 1991. I was in the dot-com boom to bust. I've grown up and I've created effectively imaginatic in recessionary times. And for those people that have experience of that, you know what you need to do. You need to cut back on unnecessary costs immediately. You need to take, sort of focus on what is important for the business and make sure you do that and strip away all of the, the sort of the crap that goes around it or the, just the, the padding you begin to change your message. I mean, right now, Imaginatic's message now has gone to some extent away from innovation and away from creativity and front and square into cost reduction, process improvement, um, return on investment. Why is that? Because in a recession, what do your clients need to do? They need to do cost reduction, process improvement, and focus on return on investment. 